To start with, how did I get into this? I was campaigning against rat running through local streets. We took the local council to the High Court. We won. They had to redo their consultation again. But what I found out is that there is no point trying to persuade politicians to do things that they don't want to do and don't have to do. And somebody told me how bad pollution was, so I did what I have done in the past, spent a couple of days looking at the internet, and I found out how bad pollution was near Harrods, but also that there are actually powerful laws in place to do something about it. And that's how I got involved in this process. We needed a mission, and that is the mission, to achieve full compliance with World Health Organization guidelines for air quality throughout London and elsewhere. So it's very much a health mission, not a legal mission, although we do use the powerful laws in place. We've had three guiding principles, I would say. The first is this, which is really about one atmosphere, which is about saying there is air pollution and there are greenhouse gases. I'll give you some examples. Those things have been considered separately. This matrix, a couple of columns, one is about air pollution, the other is about greenhouse gases, and London, rest of world. The idea here is that people who talk about complying with climate targets in 2020, 2050, to my mind are no different to generals behind the front lines, 20 miles behind the front lines in a chateau in the First World War, drawing sweeping lines to invade through France or Germany, depending on which side of the front line they're on. This is basically air pollution stuff is about complying with things which in Oxford Street, our busiest shopping street in London, are breached by a factor of three and a half times the World Health Organization guideline and legal limit. Now conversely, if we actually comply with air pollution laws, World Health Organization guidelines in that top left box, we can basically show everyone how to achieve their wider climate and sustainability objectives. And so I really do think that if we think holistically about one atmosphere, we'll actually achieve a lot more. Traffic management, to me, is really about two overlapping circles. There's an emission circle, a congestion circle. You tackle one of these, it does help slightly the other. But it's very important that we don't think that we're actually addressing air quality or air pollution when we tackle congestion directly. And this is the sort of principle which I call the London principle, which is basically just about making trade-offs between the greenhouse gases and, and air pollution. So if you actually say, we will not do anything on air pollution if it makes CO2 1% worse, you are handicapping yourself and you will never achieve anything. And the classic example is you actually end up doing something really stupid. You end up with diesel, which is the plague of Europe at the moment. I've spent 10 years really trying to build media interest and public understanding about air pollution. And this is a classic example of the way I've done it. Oxford Street breaches the annual legal limit for nitrogen dioxide on about the 4th, sometimes it's the 5th of January. So that's me standing there with the TV crew at the end of the first week in January highlighting this problem. Quite different to fighting rat running traffic. Here I've just got to say the government's breached the, the air pollution laws again. These are some of the media outlets that have covered the work that I've done over the last 10 years. You can see it's a, a very international lot. What I have found in building public understanding is that it's actually an awful lot easier to build public understanding and warn the public. And you can see here a, a chap in London, a cyclist who's uh, wearing a mask. I've done a sort of informal survey, and I think one in 20 cyclists in London now wears a mask. Of course, these things don't protect you, particularly from the fine particles and gases, uh, but they clearly do something. But what I have found uh, is it's an awful lot easier to warn the general public uh, than politicians. I don't know whether they don't want to listen or too busy, but this is a survey I've done a couple of times through a parliamentary polling organisation. Survey of 100 MPs, they have been asked to rank the five public health risks, so going from smoking, obesity, alcoholism, road traffic accidents and air pollution. All of the parties ranked air pollution at least fourth out of those five. 
and the Conservatives, who are currently the government, ranked air pollution um, fifth, which is behind road traffic accidents. And of course, statistically speaking, in London, in the UK, in Europe in fact, about 10 times as many people are killed statistically from air pollution as road traffic accidents. And that is just from PM 2.5, and we'll talk more about nitrogen dioxide. So the politicians, frankly, haven't got a clue. Now that is really quite troubling, particularly after 10 years. Some key milestones and successes. I'd just like to highlight a few of these. It was getting started. I accused of being very even-handed about this campaign. I accused the previous government, Labour government, a couple of governments ago, of one of the biggest public health cover-ups uh, or failings for not disclosing the number of attributable deaths from long-term exposure to PM 2.5. That was a very brave moment when I sent that off, but it was actually investigated by three parliamentary inquiries and my numbers were confirmed. And when Frank Kelly, who's the Professor Kelly, who's the chairman of the Committee on Medical Effects of Air Pollutants and was sitting in front of one of these parliamentary inquiries and was asked, you know, about these Clean Air in London numbers. And he said, well, they're about right. You've never seen 10 MPs sit bolt upright in a room before in your life because they, of course, were expecting him to say, well, the guy's a lunatic. The Olympics, a, a tremendous focus. We achieved a lot there. And that's really when we got a lot of NGOs involved. So there were really only two or three NGOs, but really there are now probably 100 organizations campaigning throughout the UK. The Europeans' Clean Air Policy Package in 2013 had two um, objectives. One is to achieve full compliance with air pollution laws throughout Europe by uh, 2020. And the second one is something called the National Emissions Ceilings Directive, which is about um, uh, policy action on sources. And I have a new role since the beginning of this year, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, as something called the High Level Intergovernmental and Stakeholder Advisory Group for its Global Environment Outlook number six. They've never had NGOs on that before, so they're having a bit of trouble getting used to listening to us. There are 26 member states and eight NGOs, and I'm the air pollution bod, so that's quite fun. This is the Mayor of London. We've produced a few cartoons, and he and I are actually on speaking terms, you'll be pleased to hear. Campaigning is quite a subtle art. The mayor can't do anything unless there's somebody actually saying there's a big problem here, do something. And then what I typically trot out with is he hasn't gone far enough, fast enough, and of course he loves that. Mm -hmm.